Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martini Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Manhattan, in New York City at the City University. And uh, it is week 10 uh, for the um, Siegel Talks. We have uh, been talking to artists and theater artists from around the globe uh, to um, share and with them their experience and listen to them uh, what that uh, COVID crisis means for them personally as an artist but also what the state of theater is in their countries. And really we, um, we journeyed um, uh, from uh, Egypt and, uh, and South Korea, Taiwan and Lebanon, Belgium, Germany, Italy, uh, um, Spain, Colombia, um, uh, Argentina, and Chile, and uh, of course uh, Germany and many, 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 many other places, Romania, Hungary, Poland, um, to hear an update and what is going on and what this crisis is doing us and also what it reveals. Um, it is, as Schreckner said, it's like a nuclear Fukushima catastrophe, but the roof of the reactor is open. We see the structure, we experience things. And, um, and uh, uh, of course, theater artists have been impacted the very first, and they will be most probably the ones who will struggle most, will not get back if there ever was a reminder that society often thinks theater and arts is not significant, not essential. We have this now. If you ever thought you don't have space and money to do things right now, we don't have the space, there is no money. But still theater has been, as we heard from um, our, our talks, a significant force in change and how closely it was to uh, times that we also experiencing and uh, now uh, people are with outrage and uh, justified outrage on the streets and what role it played whether it was South Africa or um, Cuba, Brazil, Chile, um, Tunisia, Romania or in Poland and um, it is uh, a, a great privilege for us to listen in artists are closer I think to realities the reality anticipate a future and help us to create meaning with them and also tell complex stories that go and go beyond the photo, the clip, the image, they really uh, show us uh, in time and sit us down to reflect and meditate. It's been a terrible, terrible week uh, in New York City and um, uh, the uh, demonstrations, the ongoing crisis, the, the murder of George Floyd. And, um, and again, it also has exposed uh, what was already there, but perhaps people are listening closer. We, had Joshua Sobol from Israel who said, you know, it's good to know that a life matters, blood that's lost matters. And he mourned uh, that what happened and, um, and we do so too. We are sharing a, a, a statement um, from the public theater. I would like to read it. Um, Oscar Eustace also was with us. He asked himself had the coronavirus was in the hallways of a Brooklyn hospital, not knowing if he would survive or not. And, um, and I know for that, for him and his work, uh, this is also um, a, a devastating um, a moment, not only for his theater, but also the state of the nation. So the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and Breonna Taylor have demonstrated in horrific fashion the racism upon which our country was built. We mourn the loss of these Black women and men, and we are grieved and outraged by their death. Theater is for of and by the people, yet it has taken us far too long to proclaim the simple truth, Black Lives Matter. We must stand in solidarity with Black artists, Black staff members, and the Black community in all communities of color. We must do more, much more, to fight the racism that infects every institution in this country, us at City University included. We must recognize that this is a time of change and that we need to be part of the change we want to see we ourselves have to change in an authentic way and we need to live up to our own ideals. We are gonna focus next week, uh, um, of course, on the situation in New York. Traditionally, we have four, sometimes even five uh, artists from around the world and one New York or one American artist, but next week will be the other way um, around. We will have Jonathan McCrory from the Black National Theater, Tamila Woodard, uh, James Scraps, and, Woody King Jr. Um, and, and others with us. Um, also the French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy will be in between um, who we scheduled some time ago. So it will be a very, very interesting week and we uh, hope uh, you will be able to listen. And we got an Instagram from a New York actor who saw the announcement for the Siegel Talk and said, no one cares about this right now. Your Siegel Talks, people are dying. Be part of the conversation about justice. 
and I think he's right, he's true, but it's also not true and it's also not right. We do need to care about what happens in the world. Globally, we have listened to our friends and colleagues from Hong Kong, Haiti, Brazil, Lebanon, South Africa, and their struggle is also our uh, struggle. Actually, America should turn away from isolation, from nationalism. Perhaps also this is part or one part of the problem that uh, it is not right to think that whatever happens here counts for so much more. And uh, because we listened to our colleagues in Lebanon, Egypt and Brazil, we have reasons to be even more outraged at the murder of George Floyd. There's a universal injustice and America is no exception to this. And America really, really should be because of its history, because the contribution it has made um, to the world. Um, for centuries, the black community has suffered more than others in this country. And it's happening at this moment again. Not only the coronavirus kills and kills them next to the police killing, so does the racial politics in the US. Social and economic inequities, poor access to healthcare, discrimination in healthcare settings, greater reliance on public transportation, much higher numbers of job in healthcare and in the service industries, and big differences in employment were all factors leading to a much greater burden of COVID-19 disease and death among people of color, much, much higher numbers. Our president refuses to wear a mask like everyone else. He suggests we should inject ourselves with disinfectant. He's hiding in a White House bunker when it gets dangerous or when he thinks or his people think it's dangerous. And he suggests that the US military should shoot American people, protesters, uh, the army that is there to protect America, American people, assist the police. So, and then he is holding up a Bible after a police clears away to a church for him with tear gas, where peaceful protesters were exercising their rights and their uh, voice for this uh, moment uh, where it is really the time to, um, to raise it. So um, this needs to change and it has to change and this will change. And we all have to look now also at the role, what does theater play? What, well, can the arts play and should play in the real, in the symbolic, and in the imaginary? And Jean-Luc Nancy will talk to us, I hope, uh, next, uh, next Wednesday. He wrote that beautiful, I gave that beautiful talk, Why Do We Need Art? What Why Is Art Useful? And we will hear from him. And uh, we need to listen to artists from other countries uh, dealing with uh, civil uprising, demonstrations, authoritarian regimes, censorships, and police killings in Egypt, Lebanon, Chile, as Guillermo Calderon told us, 400 demonstrators got shot in the eyes intentionally by the police, mostly students, to scare them um, from the police and the military. So in Cuba and Brazil, what happens is significant and what artists found. So we need to know what we can learn from South Africa, from artists like Basil Jones or Cuba, from artists like Tanya Proguera, and um, what theater, what performances did they create? How did it contribute to change? What worked, what didn't work, and how did it um, uh, contribute to a change? The Siegel talks also are always about art and making art, and making art uh, in the time um, of Corona and decisions we make. And we have with us a, a great young artist, uh, Ashley Tata, who is here. Uh, thank you for, for coming, listening also in this difficult week and also for, for listening to that um, long um, opening, but I think it is important. Um, Ashley, um, we have her here, not only so we know, need to know, uh, well, how is it uh, for a New York artist? Uh, young emerging New York artist, a female woman, artist, director in the city, how was the experience anyway, but also what uh, did she find? Uh, what does she do? And she did direct uh, um, The Met Forest by Carol Churchill, it was commissioned and barred by Gideon Lester. And instead of canceling it, she's like, try to find a way with Zoom and with friends and with coders and uh, new software they developed and created something that I think is a piece of art and an interesting new way of, uh, of a working and a meaningful way and to help us perhaps also get comfortable with these new times we are in. So um, Ashley, first of all, thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. So um, normally I say, what time is it? Uh, because most of the time we have time changes, but uh, you're the same, where are you? And uh, how are you doing? Uh, hi, Frank. Thanks for asking me to do a seagull talk. Um, I've been tuning in uh, to, to to a few of them, and I think it's um, been exciting who you have who you've had on, and I'm looking forward to the people who you'll have on next. Well, um, 
so thank you for keeping a conversation going. Um, you know, obviously there is a lot to, to consider about right now. And, and I, I would, I feel very uncomfortable saying I'm talking for, you know, the New York artists or whatever. I mean, I can talk about, um, you know, a very specific experience that I've been having, uh, but I, I am in, um, I'm in Brooklyn right now at my uh, apartment. Um, so it is 12, 12, which that means I've been here for 12 minutes. Um, uh, and uh, I am, uh, you know, I, I'm here. So that's, that's been, uh, you know, this, this past, the past weeks, you know, um, seven or eight days in particular, I feel like that's the answer that I've been able to come up to, to that question. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, before the, before the protest started, you know, it was just referring to coronavirus. It was uh, more along the lines of, um, you know, I'm doing as well as possible given the circumstances. Uh, and and I've found that my uh, vocabulary has gotten a lot smaller <laughs> for to, in order to describe how how I'm doing right right now. So I've been trying to do a bit more, asking other people how they're doing, and um, uh, as a, as a way to 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 understand how people are able to articulate things right now and emotions right now. So, um, and I think it's really difficult um, and, and sometimes impossible. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, so that's how I am. How are you doing? <laughs> well, it's uh, of course a, a, a complex time and, um, and um, we all are struggling to find to ways to do the right thing. And we don't know as much as the world is uncertain um, we really have to rethink everything. And uh, I felt strongly we keep up uh, uh, our invitations. We have planned for a long time this week. We had Ralph Tena from the um, Mai Theater Company talking about the um, Asian American Theater Company and how it is for them over decades, how complicated it has been uh, to uh, uh, get a foothold uh, into it and how big the challenge is for him now with COVID. How will his company survive? What will he do? He's changing his uh, theater into a TV studio and thinking about VR and uh, connecting to theater artists from Asia. And he says it's uh, dangerous, it's, uh, but also challenging. It reminds him the time he, he started out in theater when you didn't know what would happen, what would happen to you. And he said it's also of course, a chance um, in there. So um, where were you when, um, when that started? Are you under uh, lockdown? Did you go out? And where were you when it all started? Well, I was, so we were working on Mad Forest. We, were, we had a, you know, we had IRL. We were in, in rehearsal in studios at Bard College um, up in uh, Annandale on Hudson. And we had rehearsed about two and a half weeks, I think, um, in a studio. We were rehearsing in the evenings with the company of performers. There are 12 performers. Um, and uh, I guess, I think it was March 11th. Um, you know, there was another production that was happening on campus the same weekend as, as Mad Forest. And so in my head, I kept on saying, if they don't cancel that production, then, then we'll be fine. You know, I th uh, we were, aware of other schools that were shutting down and other productions that had been canceled. And I had been receiving, you know, text messages and emails from colleagues in, you know, opera world and theater world and academia and all the different kind of places where I um, have connections and colleagues and friends and, and collaborators. And they were all reporting how their productions had been canceled or, or postponed, hopefully. Um, and, uh, so yeah, March 11th, Gideon called me and said that the other production that was scheduled to open the same weekend as Mad Forest, which I th think was the first weekend in April, um, that that would be postponed to the fall. And, um, and that the options that we had, I mean, he did, he did present the option to, to kind of, to, to go home for, for, you know, the, the, uh, for my, myself and the stage manager were both the kind of professional uh, um, people on the project who were who are currently had been involved on the ground on the piece. You know, we were living in this house in Anna and Dylan Hudson together, and um, and he said that you know we could go home and and the designers could be you know uh, could be really could could stop working. Um, and he did. I will say. I mean, I hope this isn't speaking too much out of school, but he did say that that everybody would be compensated for the work like fully, mm -hmm. which. I think I bring that up just because of 
of, um, you know, in, in, in a kind of acknowledgement of uh, Bard was in a kind of position where the producers were able to support us that way. I know that there are other, uh, there are other organizations that weren't able to, to do things like that. So, um, so I just, so I thought that that was pretty great, but, but, and then he also said, if, or is, you know, he'd heard of a company in Oregon that was doing a radio production of, of something that they were in rehearsal for. He said, could you do something like that? And I said that I don't think that something, you know, Mad Forest, which takes place during the, um, it takes place during the before, during and after of the Romanian revolution in the late eighties and then early, you know, 89 to 90 of Romania. Um, so the first act, which takes place before the revolution and under the Ceausescu dictatorship, there are many scenes which are written um, in silence and it's about the action that people take in silence when they're worried that they're being um, surveilled and that the, that the words that they say could condemn them to torture, death, um, you know, or losing job, any range of things. So I said that I didn't think that that would maybe work so well in a radio play, though I'm sure somebody could figure that out. And um, and I said, why don't we try? Why don't we figure out how to do it online? Uh, and he said, great. And then you know the next call I made was to uh, the the design team. We had on the project we had a, a um, we had costume design, uh, scenic design, sound design, choreographer, lighting design, um, and I called all of them, and we had a we had a meeting and I, you know, and I started kind of riffing on, I think that this is how lighting design, you know, to Abby Hope Brady, who's a lighting designer, I said, I think you could, you know, send lighting units to people, you know, to people in their homes and, and, you know, to the scenic designer, Afsun Pajofar, I said, I think that you could um, create virtual backgrounds for them to be working with. And then to Dan Safer, who's the choreographer, I was, I was saying, you know, I'm sure we could figure out how to choreograph for this, for whatever this frame is. Uh, and Paul Pinto, who's the sound designer, I was like, what would it be like if you were able to incorporate the the um, the difficulties of Zoom and of Zoom audio, like the gating issue and even like the lagging issue and try to build that into this, the sonic design for the piece now. So, so you know, very quickly we started, and, and Alsta Hossiter, who's the costume designer, you know, there was a consideration of how much of the body mm -hmm. must we now costume, you know? But, but, you know, kind of just started riffing in a very quick, quick, conversation with them all and, and with them most of them had had their productions canceled at that point and so everybody was saying you know I think it's perfectly fine for us to continue working on this project and let's see how to figure it out and then that night Gideon and I met with the company of performers and we asked them if they would be interested in in continuing this and I think that what was um, I've talked to a few people who were working, especially with students during this period and I think they're all what, students they're yeah this, the performers are all students yeah um, ranging, I mean, there are freshmen to seniors. I mean, I think four of them in the company did graduate just, you know, last month. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we also gave them the option to, to not continue with the project if they didn't feel like it. Um, uh, because I think that what has been really important during this period is to recognize that it's a big, um, you know, people, people are in shock, young people are in shock. Well, I think everybody's in, was, is in some state of shock. And then, and then the other thing was, was kind of, there was a decision that had to be made at, at one point about whether people were staying on campus or going home. And so that kind of created a whole lot of other type of complications. And, um, and so, you know, so for the most part, most of them said that they were interested in trying to figure out what the thing could possibly be with like varying degrees of skepticism, they were interested in it. So, um, so we had a couple more rehearsals in real life and then um and then they declared the shutdown in the city and i came back to brooklyn right before the shutdown briefly and you know and again like in being in a very kind of privileged and and lucky position um the, the folk at Bard, they said, well, you know, that house that you were staying in, there's nobody coming up there to stay there. So if you want, you can, you know, shelter in place, um, shelter in place there. So, so I ended up going back and doing the rest of the rehearsal for the Bard production there. Um, I also, like I told you, I've been on crutches this whole time. So it also, there was like some logistic things that made it, you know, a bit easier to be uh, out of town. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so we proceeded to do these rehearsals online and that first week of rehearsal online was a big transition. And there was a lot of, you know, really having to listen to people and see where they're at and checking in with everybody. Um, uh, and, and just trying to figure out how to perform 
platform and a story and how to create a sense of community and a sense of connection when everybody was now, you know, I mean, there, we had people in Oregon, California and the middle of the country and, and up and down the, the East Coast. So, um, yeah, and then I just came back to Brooklyn, um, you know, because then the other thing that happened, I mean, the, you know, like the, a lot of details in between, but then we ended up getting a, you know, a, tra an, a transfer to theater for a new audience. And so we just performed that production uh, last week. And so I came back to Brooklyn, uh, uh, you know, this the, last week. So, yeah. Um, no. So, so tell us a bit. So you um, started together as a group for two weeks and then the shutdown happened. Uh, people went to their places. You got the chance and took it, uh, the challenge. And others have said no. I know many things uh, um, discontinued, whether they were paid or not. And uh, you said, let's see, we find a, a form, a way to do something that's respectful to that play. Um, many people say it's the most significant play, you know, a European uprising written by a British woman. They wrote a fantastic play about demonstrations on the street and uh, also brutality and uh, killings and, uh, and what it does to families. Um, so um, you decided to, uh, uh, that, that the, the play was important. How did, how was that play chosen? Why that play at this time? Yeah, well, I mean, the th yeah, so the, Gideon and I had been talking about a play for me to, to direct in that, in that semester, uh, for for a while and we'd gone through I think this was the third play that we had considered me directing you know and just for example one of the first pieces that I was interested in doing was a was an Orestes which I think is a great I mean I think it's a great play to be done right now um mm -hmm. but we decided we decided against that and um and then there was another play that we were talking about so we you know there was uh and then finally kind of in a he had sent me, uh, I was, I was jokingly calling it my Gideon Lester reading list where he was sending like in the mail, he was sending me a, a, a book of plays a week or whatever, just to read and consider. And there was a, there's a Thyestes that Churchill had worked on that, that he sent me in a collection. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I was interested in doing a Thyestes as well, but then, um, I, you know, ha having to do with roles and, and considerations of that, I decided that that, that didn't, I don't know, it didn't see, seem as feasible, but in that collection was also Mad Forest, which I had seen a production of when I was in grad school, another student, uh, and I think in a class above mine had done a grad school production of it. And I, I don't have a really strong memory of it, um, uh, but I, 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 I flipped it open and I read, I basically read, you know, the first couple of lines or whatever from every single scene and there are a lot of scenes but I didn't I certainly didn't read the entire play because I was in, in a, under a time crunch and I just needed to so I said to Gideon I said you know I, I don't, I'm just reading a little bit of Mad Forest and maybe that's for some reason I felt like it's been overproduced or something and, and and I said you know maybe that's not really interesting but I think actually I mean there are enough pieces just from reading it really quickly that made me feel like there was something in it that is very much speaking to our time and again it's I guess it's interesting I mean that was our time four months ago, which is certainly different than our time two months ago, which is certainly different than our time a week ago, it's certainly different than our time today. So, um, but, but our time four months ago, there was something that seems to be relevant and necessary about telling a story about a group of people who, um, a group of, you know, a lot of young people who, uh, who, who there, for whom there is an uprising, they overthrow a brutal dictatorship. And then, you know, it's not like, I mean, the structure of the thing is is great because it's not like there's there's a revolution and then everybody's happy. You know, there's 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 disc there is uh, there's oppression and fear and and the threat of and the constant threat of violence. There is an act which is which is all spoken, which is this is the second act. It happens kind of it's people. It's more in a documentary style theater where it's or it's people speaking. You know, one would say directly to the speak to the audience. Um, recalling the events of the of the actual five days or, or so of the revolution so that in some ways is the is the most violent act or the bloodiest act even though it's it's people direct audience addressing um and and then there's a third act that goes back into a narrative form of these families that we've witnessed in the first act and in that third act you see kind of the the repercussions of revolution of what it means to be in a new landscape and what it means to be people who are used to an old way of living, having to figure out how to adjust to the new landscape. And, and I think ultimately the responsibility that comes with 
with having lived through something that has created a new landscape. And that to me, I felt was really important to be talking about during an, during an election year in particular. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how we came to that play. Um, when we, I also had wanted to work with a video designer from the beginning because I usually, I work with a lot of media and in, 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 in most all my work is, you know, now for sure. Um, and you know, there wasn't a budget line for that. So I was going to do the video design, which was not going to be very sophisticated, but I was going to, to, to take it as an opportunity to kind of figure some things out that were interesting to me. Um, and, and that was because, you know, there's a lot that's been spoken about during the Romanian revolution as a time when, t you know, TV and the use of television by the Ceausescu regime, but also the, the use of kind of amateur television and camcorders um, was, was, could convey both the message of, of the dictatorship, but also a message of the uprising. Um, again, themes that I don't think have dissipated at all in recent, in the, in, in the 30 years that, since it, it was written. Um, so I think that, that that, so when we moved into an online space, that actually started to become more apparent and more obvious and was, was and, and then we did bring in a, a video designer, my friend Eamon Farrell, who I've worked with on a number of projects. Um, he, he, well, he called me up and he said, I saw that you're doing this online, who's gonna do your video? And I said, boom, me, I think. And he said, well, if you want me to be a consultant, I can do that. And I said, well, how about, well, I basically said, asked the folk at Bard to be able to add now a video design budget line, which, which, which they did. And we brought on Eamon and Eamon is a, is also, I mean, he's a wonderful artist and director and he has a theater company called Anonymous Ensemble that have been doing kind of, they've been exploring online performance for, um, for, for a while now. And I've worked with them on another project. Um, and he Eamon is a teach is a professor and one of his students who was uh, who graduated this year was a double major in theater and computer science, I believe. And so so this student, Andy, uh, he had kind of been floating the idea of working on a code to modify Zoom so that a computer keyboard could become a mixing board, you know, um, so uh, and and Eamon said, you know, he, they were about, everybody was about to go into spring break. And so Eamon just said to him, if you want to go ahead and finish that code, now would be a great time to do it. And so our first week of online rehearsals, we didn't have the code. So we were doing things like trying to trick Zoom to take camera cuts, like coughing into a microphone. So the camera would cut to the speaker or things like that. And um, I think by the end of the, or maybe by the beginning of the second week of rehearsal, Andy had received a, um, the key from Zoom to allow him to, like the developer key to, to allow him, us to implement the code. And so then we were able to rehearse as if we were kind of like in a TV studio with this technology, which made, which made editing just more fluid um, and made it, you know, um, made the, you know, made the script that I had then re-edited with, with different camera cuts uh, uh, more achievable by, by, the, by the person who was brought on to be the mixer, um, the video mixer. So that that's that. And then, oh, and the other thing I'll just say about the play is that obviously, you know, it's a piece that was written for uh, Carol and Mark Wing Davey made it in collaboration with with student actors in England. And then they went to Romania months, just months. Right, the after. first production was with, was with students, right? Yeah. Yeah. The first production was with students and those students and Carol and Mark, I believe, went to Romania and talked to Romanian, Romanians and also I think Romanian theater students as well. And they, and that's how they made, that's how they made the work, which then premiered in 1990, which is only, you know, which is in a year, within the year of when the revolution happened, the revolution, I mean, like it's, it's December and that of 89. So, so it's really remarkable that, I mean, to me, it's remarkable that they did have a, in some ways had a sense of the history, even as, it, even as they were living it, you know? Um, but that, that production was student performed and then that production also transferred to a professional theater and was in London and was also performed by student actors still. When it came to the States later on, it was performed by a professional company, you know, by a professional company of actors. Um, so I felt like it's a, it's a piece that allows for, you know, a real company of performers. Um, they play multiple roles. There's a lot of roles in the piece. I can't remember off the top of my head how many there are, but it's, it's, it's tens, more than tens. I mean, it might be like something close to 30. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, and I could also do it and 
cast, um, you know, cast with, 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 uh, uh, you know, you, basically pe the, the students who came in who were interested in the material you know I could I could kind of you know we could play with with who you know who was playing who and there could be real diversity in the voices of who was performing which roles which I was um, which I was excited by uh, so yeah so I think for all those reasons that that it, that it seemed to be the right piece and then what was really exciting was that as it moved online it became it, there was a different type of breath that that came to it and I feel in a lot of ways um, the, the medium of Zoom or whatever this is really supported th the content. And, and the only reason I really pointed to the Orestes in the beginning is that I don't think, you know, Gideon is is a artistic director, producer, and also a dramaturg. And I feel like both of us knew that if, that you couldn't just take, I don't think, well, I wouldn't have felt comfortable taking any play and putting it online. It, ha it had to be, I don't think, for example, Orestes necessarily would have been something that I would have wanted to explore online. Um, principally because of how to coordinate, like how to do a choral ode right now to me seems a bit tricky, but um, I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um. In incredible. Um, first of all, like, happy to hear that uh, uh, innovations come out of a university setting. That's what we all think it should be. It was for a long time, I think, uh, in, in Germany in the 60s or 70s students theater, a student was significant. Um, the Peter Steins and Sadeks and uh, Paimans of the world are world student festivals. Um, the decent school where I was, um, the, the rainy Polish and Shishi Pop and Rimini come out. Yeah, sure. And and I think um, this is now also a, a signal that an innovation uh, comes out of a college um, um, setting or giving space and making suggestions, but ultimately leaving artists. Uh, in him, you anticipated something that's atmosphere, what you felt uh, that this play was right and you were right. And perhaps it was even much more prophetic, we hope when the elections come up, you know, that things also will change in a dramatic way. Um, and I like that you had an artistic idea first, mm. uh, that you had an aesthetic idea, and then you brought in a team of a software designer. So we have a traditional old form of centuries out of theater and, um, and then you brought it together with Zoom, which um, is um, a way a new technology. It's a 21st century way of communicating uh, that we all are experiencing. I never had a Zoom session before I started my talks here, but now we use it. And it's uh, almost like an e email seems like an old thing of the past. Um, so um, what, why did you think um, the Zoom aesthetic would actually help to communicate the, the the essence, the soul, the the, the, the message of the play. Uh, I don't. I mean, I the, it, you know, the zoo, it was the only thing that was that was available to us. You know, I mean, that's kind of so. But I think that um, so the aesthetic that we layered on top of it was the same aesthetic that that. I mean, it was interesting to see what of the design choices we were able to translate into the into the virtual space. So there was, you know, in, in the scenic design world, there was a whole, Afsun had come up with a really beautiful stage scenic design and it was, it was really elegant and also kind of took us through the three different um, psychological and poetic and, and uh, spaces of the world of the piece as we, as we saw it. And, you know, so the first act was designed in the theater to be performed against a big, uh, you know, kind of brutalist uh, cement wall. And the performers had, I think, six feet of space from the wall to the to the downstage edge. So we staged the whole piece um, in that kind of, uh, in that space. And then over the course of the second act, the wall would would rise and, and we would use that wall as, as a projection surface to, to project some archival footage from the time, mostly because I felt like our audience doesn't have, you know, in when this was happening, even an American audience had more of a relationship to the events. So I felt like, uh, you know, we maybe needed to do a little bit of filling in that gap for to bring our audience a little bit more into that headspace. And then, and there would be a whole movement piece that happened kind of behind the wall as people were direct audience address, you know, with microphones to, to create a kind of vocal intimacy um, to uh, the, the events of the second act. And then in the third act, the, the wall is revealed and the the space, um, or sorry, the wall comes all the way up and the space that is revealed is a hospital waltz bucolic ballroom kind of setting. So it feels a little bit like a, an over gaudy party or, you know, like 
you just got access to some type of you know beautiful ballroom and you don't quite know how to decorate it uh the right way and it just feels a little sickly and so that's where the third act was to take place um so originally when we moved online i've soon started by kind of taking the the model renders and and making those into virtual backgrounds and we realized that that doesn't help the audience understand who's in the same room together or anything like that so she so she went ahead and designed uh you know ended up thinking i think more in terms i mean at one point at you know two in the morning or whatever i get a text from her being like this is great it's like i'm a production designer you know and so so she ended up designing something a bit more in that with that eye i guess but she made i, I think we ended up using something like 130 or 150 different virtual backgrounds that she created for each of the students to put up manually over the course of the show that that are you know this is a room and and then and so these characters are clearly in this room and they're in this world and then these characters are in this mm -hmm. world together um and uh, but the thing that we were able to transfer were ideas about overall kind of ambiance of each of the acts or color temperature, things like that. All of that was able to transfer from the IRL production to to her uh, to her virtual back backdrops and how we ended up shaping the the, the bigger um, aesthetic sense of the of the world. The so so tied into all of that was um when i was talking when i was thinking that i would make you know have some video design there was an idea of of it being the kind of you know 80s 90s uh vhs you know kind of more old school i guess television aesthetic um and when we started working completely uh, via video that be that was a layer that Eman added to, to everything so so the um what is broadcast out to the viewer is in a is in like a four three ratio which is that kind of more you know instagrammable type of uh uh ratio and with with different types of kind of tv filters put on top of everything and and this is something that i've done in other projects where the the chances that there could be a technical glitch or maybe vocals could get out of sync or things like that could happen is add different type of filters or 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 put some type of something that's glitchy into the visual aesthetic so that it becomes it makes the medium more forgiving for when those things actually do happen so um so yeah i mean the the, the thing of zoom i mean i didn't think that the zoom, you know these these cameras that we are working with have you know don't have a great depth of field and there's um so the idea so everything becomes two-dimensional in a different, like in a very extreme way, very quickly. So we kind of had to rethink everything about what we were doing. The scenic design had to become that way accordingly. We started thinking more in terms of collage aesthetic and, and kind of a cubism, you know, how do you break things apart and, and, and lay them out like this rather than doing anything that has to do like that, you know? Uh, so, and I think even in some respect, like Dan's choreography changed in that way, you know, things ended up being a lot about this and less about that. Although there are some places where this becomes a really interesting place to look at as well. Um, and there are a couple of places where like, you know, the actor will put a bottle like right here and that does a different thing, but different than in film, you know? So that's, it became interesting to see how is it different than film and how is it different from theater and how is it really its own thing? And then you just tried to explore what was interesting about that. And, and, and I think that, you know, what's interesting to me also is to, to take uh, to take the exploration to the to the edge of where the technology kind of starts to break down, and then you can find the art in it. I think, or, or I mean, because I guess it's the human fallibility that gets put into it at that point. Um, uh, so, but but then I guess the thing that that Zoom does necessitate, and that also the larger reality of being in isolation necessitates, is you know, we couldn't, nothing could be made out of the recognition that nobody is in, in, a, in a space together. So for example, the scene where um, two characters hug each other, uh, how to do that was, you know, was a big, was a big question. And we, you know, we did a thing that, that I think weirdly is, is, in, is touching because it, it, it's, it's not performed out of the, the, the acknowledgement that nobody can be together. So what does it feel like to, if I can't hug another person, is it at all satisfying to hug myself and have that kind of um, felt experience maybe transferred in some way? Um, and the the scene, and then when we, but then and then also when we did the the work when we did the production at Tafana in the course of the month between having 
develop the piece at Bard and then develop developing it for Tafana and this, this coder. And I will say the other thing, you know, you said about the college, you know, the relationship of an academic institution to creating work. I mean, I, I, I just, I find it important to kind of underline that the, the, the other thing that we were able to do that I feel like a lot of academic institutions aspire to, but it's, it's not always seen is a symbiotic relationship between different um, departments and specifically in this case between computer science and theater. Um, you know, Andy was, I mean, it, we've had conversations about the thing that he's he's coding he's basically coding for the problems that I'm creating so so you know the person with the visual idea or whatever is saying this is what I would like this thing to be able to do and then and then creates a problem that then he can go and try to solve right and I think that that is a thing where um, I I've, I've felt that too often in academia everything is so siloed that that people are either solving problems that already have solutions to or having to create problems that don't need to be solved you know so um, so that so that was a really and it is true that I mean if it I, I frequently thought that we were very very lucky for this to be happening at Bard which has some type of support fi, you know financial support and also they had the staff support because the production team was also they immediately jumped on the problem and they, you know, and they said, okay, well, we can figure out how to send duplicate props to these different parts of the country. We can figure out how to send green screens to everybody. We can order Bluetooth headphones for everybody and send it out. And they, um, and without, you know, without that support, it wouldn't have been the, the thing that it ended up being. I mean, I do think that there's a lot that people can do without a production team behind them um, in this medium, which I think is also important. But, um, but we were definitely lucky that we ha that we were in that position exactly when this this happened. Um, uh, oh, so oh, right. But the only other thing I wanted to say was in the you know so in the month between doing it at um, at Bard and then doing it at Tafana, Andy had figured out Andy and Eamon or er, had figured out how to basically create a situation where a performer could be live performing and be in the same square as another performer. And so there's a scene that happens late in the play where a ghost appears. And, um, and so we called these two actors in to do a rehearsal before, like to do a tech rehearsal and they didn't realize what we were doing. And so there, you know, one of them is in, uh, one of them I think is in upstate New York and the other is in a different part of the state of New York. And so they're, you know, so they're performing the scene and it has to do with the ghost basically asking a nurse if she would like to go with him. Um, and he kind of, and, and so they were performing the scene together and then he kind of looked to his computer and he started freaking out because he saw that the two of them appeared to be right next to each other. And it was this really incredible moment where also all of us realized that we haven't seen like two people in real time being in the same space together in, in, you know, at that point, like almost two months. So that was kind of an amazing, an amazing moment. Um, and also very exciting for, for the implications that, that, that could, that there could be. But I, but I also think that the, I also think the play ended up fundamentally conveying something that had to do with um, people really trying to connect with each other through space and time and all the obstacles that are being put in front of them, whether it be um, systemic or, uh, or physical. So, and, and so that all obviously transferred as well. We also, I was also very lucky that um, I did, you know, through most of the process, um, I was able to kind of have uh, short email um, exchanges with Carol Churchill, which was really, which was really, oh, um, really? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like she, I mean, I went, I, I had, yeah, I had emailed her when we were, go, when we were hoping to make the move online just to, to make sure that it was something that she felt made sense or, or would be at least in theory supportive of. And, and she was, and, 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 uh, and it was really, that was, that was really nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How, how um, incredible, um, I mean, you uh, touched already on um, on so many things, you know, how to be together in one room, one space when you're not together, uh, but Zoom uh, found a way with um, a co altered code that a uh, Zoom company collaborated with a theater artist to change the system basically of the code and to adapt it, um, that you uh, found a way to, uh, express or uh, to create a piece of art and i think what you did is a piece of art and um, to express um, um out of necessity not by choice uh, um, um um something that the play um in a way is um all about and um 
And I can also see a line. I see, you know, the work of Kastorf and the Volksbühne. There's work you worked, I'm sure, with Robert Woodrow. Your work with Jay Scheib, Daniel Fish. And uh, I saw your Marie-Louise Fleisser, um, the Purgatory in Ingolstadt, where you had the video work. It was also, I think, students, acting students, Marymount, I think, um, uh, yeah. if I remember right. Where yeah. you, it was close to the aesthetic also you created for there. So these were all like, in the good sense, experiments, research, finding a way they filmed each other. It was uh, so much about the you know, teenage angst or densely, highly emotional charged moments. Um, but then you created the Met Forest, which in a way for our viewers, I, of course, I should have told you, prepare a clip and show it to us, but it's, it's not possible anyway. But it's almost like a graphic novel setting, you know, with like photos manipulated in some kind of a um, drawn line of a pop art, uh, it's in recalling early computer games, uh, recalling early, early MTV. Um, but on the other hand, um, the, the fastness of it, the, the shared screens, um, it's a bit like the houses of Reza Abdu in some of his plays when he had sure. some parallel happening in the, mm -hmm. uh, on stage. He was also a visionary in that way. So you, um, you created something that um, somehow is a new form do you think and i would like to have an, 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 an honest answer do you think it was a better production than it without zoom um uh, uh, before i address that better okay i'm gonna write down better so i don't forget that word um uh, the, uh I, I would just like to say that the 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 thing that i think is very important about i mean because of the tech and, and and the code and everything we were able to create the visual experience of people maybe being in a space together but one of the really important things in working with the performers that that you know that i, I just i i i'm incredible i continue to be incredibly impressed with with their ability ability to do this is is how they had to have inten an intense amount of energy in activating their imagination in order to put, you know, their colleague who they were, you know, very close with a few months ago, right here, so that they could really, you know, and we, we, you know, we had action the text and everything, so they d directed this action of, you know, to seduce right here, and then, and then they could play put their other colleague right here, but that. You know that kind of energy because at first there was this whole conversation about what is it to act in in this type of, of void um and and so there are a lot of you know i was ref referring them to very early silent films where in a lot of cases it was a performer who's alone behind a camera with with maybe a director yelling at them off camera you know but and and there is nobody off off camera for you to perform with other than like the you know than the leg of the camera or something so i think that uh so i but i feel like the 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 activating of the imagination is also something that that couldn't happen um that made this possible like the thing couldn't have happened without that with the with the active imagination of the performers and the immense amount of energy that went behind that and then also the kind of like trust and imagination of of all of the collaborators including the production team um uh and I also think that's just something that that I'm I'm hoping that this period allows as an opportunity is for everybody to just to, to be much more active in their imagination of what I mean that's kind of the the most important thing about living in an unknown period I think is that I mean it can either be dangerous and um, uh, and arresting and um, you know. And and can just kind of paralyze you, or it can be something that gives you gives you the opportunity for hope in a way. So, um, and they did an incredible job of 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 doing that and staying in that in that world while while they were performing. Um, the, I mean, as far as it being better, you know, I, I think that um, I. I don't know, I quite I quite liked. I quite liked what we ended up making. I, I mean, I, I actually, I actually did, and and there was a bit of, you know, trying to conv convince some people to to watch it. Um, I mean, I think even with you, yes. <laughs> um, uh, which thank you for watching it, um, and thanks everybody who watched it because, but but I think um, I think is. I don't know. I, 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 because who, you know, I think that whenever I'm making something, I'm never really able to, to see what, what I think it, you know, what I think about it until it's, it's pretty much over, you know, or even beyond over. So I'm not entirely sure. I do, I do think that the scenic design would have been pretty great. Um, 
I think that the sound design was going to be really great. I think the, I mean, yeah, I think all the elements would have been really great. Um, but I think that, I don't know, there's something about this, this form that I really do actually have an affinity for. And, and especially in the very beginning, was, you know, to me, it was important to, to make this thing. Well, first of all, because I just don't know what else to do. I mean, I've always only ever, I just, I just make a lot of, I make a lot, like I'm, I'm very regularly in a rehearsal room in some capacity. And um, so I just didn't, I really couldn't imagine going into isolation and not having something to be making. I mean, I thought I just, you know, I know a lot of people are and, and have done and, and I'm doing that more now, but, um, and I also felt, you know, in my experience, you know, making theater, some form of theater, making something is, you know, has, is, is how I basically survive, uh, through, you know, and, and I felt like it probably would be very useful for the students in particular and for the entire design team, you know, anybody, every, and the production team, if we had something that we could work on while we were going into isolation. So, so to me, it was kind of like this, you know, this is how we survive something is we just, is we keep on making things. Um, and, but I feel, uh, but then, but then I also felt like it was that, and you know, and then the next thing became, can, is it something that's viable? Like, is, is it something at all that people would maybe consider watching? Because I also think increasingly right now, as far as the state of theater, I mean, I think in particular in America, um, uh, obviously there are a lot of massive changes that, that hopefully are coming. Um, um, but I, I, but I do worry about, I do worry about how long um, we will have to be in some version of isolation and, you know, when audiences will feel comfortable coming back to the theater and how dependent upon we are, our audiences that makes things complicated. So I kind of feel as, you know, in an existential kind of way that there is some necessity to, to, to acknowledge that this could be a version of theater that, that producers could potentially get behind and that audiences could potentially get behind and performers and designers could potentially get behind because I don't know how we survive, we as the theatrical community survive th this period, especially if, you know, depending upon different projections, we could have to become very flexible with going indoors for a period of time, you know, off and on for, uh, for, for, for an extended period of time. So, um, so for me, it was like, can we make something that's at all viable? And I've been incredibly heartened by talking with a number of theater makers who saw it and, you know, were, were inspired to start thinking about how they could also make for something like this, this form. Um, and, and, and I've also said, you know, those students actually, the students in, in Mad Forest, you know, they still had to finish school. So they were still making projects and they've made some really, really wonderful works since then. And, and I've seen some of it. And I also had, have started to have conversations with them about, about what really this form means. Like, what is it, f why does something feel live on this? And why doesn't it feel live? Why What's does- your answer? Um, I mean, there, there seems to be, I mean, so, so it's, some of it seems ineffable, but, but I feel like, you know, on the Wednesday afternoon showing up to Fano, we had a tech malfunction. So we had to go offline for, I think it was like seven minutes. And, um, and that, I mean, people felt like that was an indication of it being live. And also one of the things that I asked when we moved online was that we have a chat feature going. So there's, so the audience is able to talk to each other about the show and, and I'm taking all that chat, not all of it. I'm taking some of the chat that I feel would be useful to the actors and I'm dropping it into their own feed so that they can have some sense of the feedback from the audience. So they don't feel like they're only performing in a void. So I actually feel like, I mean, the chat feature, I guess is kind of controversial. I think some people really don't like it. Um, I myself don't know that I would be an active participant in the chat feature in, in other experiences I have been, and I haven't been, um, but I think, um, but, but what I have known is that that does create a feeling of a sense of community and just people, you know, audience members being able to talk to each other in real time makes them see that, that it's, that it's a live experience. Um, and, and I do, and also, you know, we did Im implement some, you know, very kind of, you know, theatrical kind of performance gestures, like having one of the performers, um, Bill, he, 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 costume changes into the role of the grandmother, Avista, like in front of the camera. And if you were to make 
I mean, maybe if you were to do something in the can, you wouldn't necessarily show that, you know? Uh, and there are enough like little glitches here and there that I think give it the sense of, um, of, of liveness. And I, and I do, and I do feel like there is there, I mean, I've been, you know, I've done, I've been taking on a bunch of things online. Um, some, some performances, you know, some, you know, your talks, um, some, I've been doing a lot of meditation. So, you know, it's like online meditation sessions, and there is something that just, I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's clear, if, it, if, it's, if it's as simple as me t saying to myself in my head and reifying that this is happening live, that makes it feel different. But I do think that there is, that there is an energy that forms around a group of people, even if they're spread out all, literally all over the world, acknowledging that, they're, that they are experiencing something that has an emotional uh, reverberance at the same time. Uh, and I, and I also, I mean, it also makes me fascinated by why is that so important? Why, you know, why is that the substitute for being, why is that right now something like a substitute for being in the same space together? Um, uh, but yeah, so, so, but I'm, but I'm very happy that these students are actually having conversations and real thoughts about what the media is. What does it mean to talk directly to camera versus talking to somebody off camera, you know, what, like, who are you implicating if you speak directly to camera? Um, so that, uh, and, you know, and these are undergrads and, these, and, and what that means to me also is that they're taking it on as a real kind of form because it's all that's afforded them right now um, to some extent. And, 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 and I think that that's really exciting. And I think that that should be, I think that it should be acknowledged and, um, uh, because it's not, you know, I mean, because it can, it can be taken legitimately if it's, um, if it's dealt with legitimately, you know. Um, oh, so better. Uh, I don't, I don't know. It's different. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's true. It didn't feel like a compromise. It did not feel like a filmed uh, performance or, you know, going through some motion. I think you, as you said, you found found a form. It's astonishing to think that you were in confinement and I think you had a fracture in your hip, you couldn't even move, uh, but you created a big, uh, big work with, I guess, I don't know, 20 people involved as a new form of production, um, using media, manipulating uh, software and media, um, teaching your students and actors about what it means to have performing media, but also the media itself, and, um, and still trying to uh, find a way to um, to give a meaning out of that play that has something to say. It is an election year, you know, to say this is uh, something, and perhaps that message in one way got, got, came through very, very clearly on, I think, um, also um, to me. So let's talk about that software or that form. Um, will that be, uh, is every drama department in America calling you? Uh, <laughs> Uh, will that be shared? Can uh, Ralph Pena at my theater company is there say, can he, because he said two days ago, he said, we change our theater in the TV room. I got a little bit of money. I cannot afford not have to work with my people. I do not know what to do. Um, I'm sure we will find something. You found something. Will that be shared? Um, and uh, what uh, what is the what's the idea behind it? Will that you know uh, that yeah. you were the first to do it, as far as I know? Um, so, but uh, what will what will happen to this um, form that almost is like a, not an acting way of acting or directing? You know, we have all these different schools of uh, from viewpoint and Brecht and uh, Stanislavski, and now maybe there's the Met, Met Forest way of doing something, uh, but. Uh, um, how is that? What's what's on your guy? What's on your mind? Um, uh, so I think that it's um, the, yeah. I mean, it, you know, we do we do talk about it quite a bit. Like the team does. Uh, I, I mean, I do. Like, there are. Let's see. Um, the well, so so everybody knows. We, I mean, if anybody's tuning in, but um, not if, sorry, it's Frank. Um, uh, the, the, we, we are going to be, we, we're supposed to have a panel with the, the kind of team of Mad Forest uh, talking about how we made it. Um, that was going to actually happen this week, but we postponed it um, uh, for, um, I'm not entirely sure until when, but, uh, but we've postponed it for now. And 
I think that there, I think that information about that can be found at Bard's website if people are interested in kind of a, a, a longer form conversation also with the entire team because like I keep on trying to emphasize that that it is the, the result of an entire team working on this thing that made it possible and a bunch of people who were not I mean they were they were scared or overwhelmed like Vanessa the, the stage manager she kept on um, I mean she she figured out how to stage manage with no stage right I mean this is so she you know she also you know uh uh in, I mean in some I mean, maybe invented it too, but she, but she created a way of working um, without being in a room with people. You know, she, she called a show. She, I think she had, at one point she was like, you know, we had different, she had different, you know, lines that she had to be listening to. And at one point she was like, no, I do not have three ears. So you cannot add another comm feed into this, you know, into this space. So, um, I mean, so, so it's just, it, it's really, uh, so that in conversation, whenever it happens, I do think will be interesting, um, but, uh, but one of the things that we've talked about with, you know, with, for example, in anticipation of that panel is for, I know that for, for a bunch of us, there is something that's really important about getting the, te getting the idea of the technology out there um, so that especially smaller companies don't feel that there is a bar to entry in order to, to, to do this type of work. Because like I say, to me, it's, this is like, it, this is an existential thing within the community is that we, we I mean, I feel like there, um, I'm absolutely respectful of people who are dis making a, a decision not to make right now and who are kind of, um, you know, I, I heard Anne, uh, heard you interview Anne and this idea of Zots and the, and the and the kind of gathering up energy before making the move. I absolutely agree with that as well. Eugenio uh, Barba. Uh, yeah, yeah. who actually will join us in 20, June 25th, I think. Yeah. Yes, and everybody yeah. should tune in for that, yeah. Um, uh, so so I, I mean, I absolutely believe in that and I respect that. And I also re respect the kind of um, the, the hesitation around kind of making things just for the sake of making things or making things for the sake of like putting a flag on the moon or, or something along those lines. Um, this happened, this felt like it happened very naturally as far as, you know, the, the medium, uh, works with this. Let's just keep going. This seems to be the next right. You know, it seems to be the next obvious step to take with at, at every single step of the way. Um, so, and again, like for me, looking further out, I, I just see, you know, many many artists who I don't I don't know how we survive this um, if if there isn't a way to make something. And there are many small companies who who wouldn't won't be able to survive what looks like a, an extended period of not of not producing. Um, so for, for me, it seems really important to get the technology out there, or the idea of the technology out there, the idea of the acceptability of something like this form, whatever it is. And, and you know, what I did, I mean, it's very, like you said, it's very much tied to an aesthetic that I already am interested in based off of work that I do in the real world um, and influences, you know, other people I've worked with and everything. So, um, so there are plenty of ways to do this. <laughs> Um, and, and I, you know, a young director just sent me work that they did on a production and they took a whole different aesthetic way of working on it. And they used a completely different technology to, to, in order to do it. So, so there are plenty of ways to, 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 to do this, this type of work and keep it relevant and keep it exciting and keep it necessary. Um, so, so I feel like we're, we're interested in, in promoting the idea that it is possible and that, uh, you know, smaller companies like like my E if there, I mean, I think that that, I, I, um, I yeah, I, I feel like having conversations, you know, keeping the information out there is, is what's important. Um, I also do think it, it, there becomes a bit of like, you know, to, to what extent, like, um, uh, I, I, I mean, I haven't been approached to, to, dir to direct anything. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit, I see, I want to ask you that as far as I know, last, last year, you are a great director, I think. Hmm. You didn't, as far as I know, I'm you sorry. didn't direct, had your job as a young woman director. How, I don't know what came now out of this. How, how is it for someone to break into the industry? I mean, we hear, of course, right now, you know, there is the, the, the posting from Griffin Matthews about uh, Broadway is racist. His experience at ART with Diane Paulus, she also answered him. Would love to have both of them here and talk about it. But, um, but the idea that it's impossible really to, to in a way to get through. How is it for you? Do you get offers? And uh, is it, uh, did anybody after this big review, which you also got from the New York Times, have you been approached by anybody? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, um, I have, 
no, but but it, there's also a pandemic, right? So I'm not, you know, um, I, I, and that's where I, it, to, it became very apparent to me that, um, that, that there's a lot of, I mean, the people, that there isn't, um, you know, people are, I think, being very still, I mean, now people are being very still and reflective for, uh, f for a whole other reason. Um, which, yeah, well, and, um, but, but I, but I, but I, you know, don't think that people are producing a lot right now, or I, I mean, I don't, I don't, at least I haven't seen a lot of that right now. Um, and, and there had been statements, you know, about theaters not producing until, um, I mean, I feel like I, that, you know, like the Guthrie until like March of 21, I think is what, what I had heard at one point. So, um, so, and that's why, I mean, for me, it's, it's more important to just to try to propose options for making work right now for, for theater artists. And I think the other thing that's interesting maybe is that the theater artist who uh, in a lot of ways is a multidisciplinary kind of artist can be taken, can like what, what it is that defines what it is to be a theater artist can maybe expand right now, you know, um, that, uh, that we, that we can take on um, multimedia work and, and you know, that, that, that all the tools that have made us survive in different circumstances in like downtown theater circumstances where you're just kind of trying to figure out how to make things work without a lot of resources. Um, all of that allows, and you, I mean, for, I know in my case and in a lot of the artists who I respect, uh, a lot of the theater artists who I really respect also have a pretty healthy dose of uh, consideration of music and performance art and and visual art and and, and all that type of work is uh, you know a real um, you know multiple media so I do think that um, I think that part of it is is us uh, reimagining how we're how we're taking space as theater artists in the larger artistic landscape um, to not kind of uh, make it an idea about specializing us onto, you know, either just Broadway or off Broadway or, you know, but that there are other places where we can um, occupy and make and, and uh, write stories and tell stories uh, and give voice to stories. Um, so, uh, so I, I try to, I mean, that's, that's what I'm considering right now is, is how can I, I, I mean, I'm talking to collaborators about work that we want to make. We don't, you know, um, have there, but there's no way to plan for it. Like there's no, uh, we'll make this work at this theater or we'll get this grant. I mean, there's just no way of planning for things as far as I know right now, or I, or I haven't figured out how to do it. So, so I'm working with a lot of collaborators who I've had, you know, traditions of working with before and, and just, you know, continuing to think of, um, what the development of this project will look like, the development of that project will look like. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been very lucky that I have, you know, I've worked with a lot of directors who I deeply respect and who are, are incredible mentors and colleagues and 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 now fr mo and now friends. Um, and I have a, I think that, I, and and I have and I have made a lot of works that I think are really great and have been, you know, and have been recognized. Um, I think that, like, I think that what a director does is. I, I think that it's confusing sometimes to 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 a lot of people actually. So um, so yeah. So I mean, uh, if anybody wants to hire me, uh, that would be cool. But <laughs> um, well, you did get a review in the the the, the opera, uh, the contemporary opera you you directed, and the mm -hmm. New Yorker was the line. It's one of the first masterpieces of the twenty first century. So refer to the music, but also to the staging. But still, um, uh, for you to 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 break into the is the New York theater system how it's set up working? Is it working for young female directors? What, what is your experience in surviving in New York as an artist? Um, I mean, I think that the New York system is really difficult for 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 artists. Um, period. So. Um, and I think that, that, you know, the, that has, a, there's just, uh, yeah. And I think that the, um, I feel like there, I mean, th these are not new, these are not new ideas or anything, but I think that there's a, um, 
I think that there's there's not as much nurturing of of local uh, artists as as you know like there seems to be a bit of presenting work that has been proven somehow and I guess by proven that means um, has has audience interest and um, and I think that maybe there is not a lot of risk taking um, in the and by risk taking by subject matter and also by the voices who are creating work. Um, and I do think that there's a bit of, um, I mean, I've found it difficult to move, move from, I found it difficult to be considered like a generative artist as a director. I think that that's something that, um, that isn't considered uh, a lot in, 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 our, in our system. Uh, and I do think, you know, and I think that with, uh, I think that funding resources become smaller and smaller. And I think there isn't, um, I think that there, it's difficult to figure out how to get the funding to make your work in order, you know, it's just kind of catch 22. Um, but I also think that that's a larger, um, I, think that be, I think that being an artist period in, in, in the, in here is, is very difficult. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, it's a big, you know, there's like a lot of, you know, it has to do with kind of values and also what we, um, what we, what we hold up and what we cherish. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I try not to get stuck. I mean, I, I will say that one of the things that I've been thinking about is that there's a lot, you know, the, doing something online, you don't have to pay for real estate yet necessarily. So, so there is, um, you know, I've been, you know, there, I think that there's an opportunity again, if, if something like this is somehow taken seriously, meaning that people are interested in seeing it um, and it can address, you know, there's something about, the de decentralization of of the of the work too, and where people can make work from, um, then then you know you can make a work without having to pay rent, which that could be that could open up a world of possibilities. Uh, rent for a theater, I mean. So um, so I uh, yeah, I I mean I just um, I feel. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard, but it's also, I mean, it's the only, it's like what I know how to do. And I think that I am actually, you know, I don't, I don't, I think I'm good at it. And so I'll keep on, you know, keep on making as long as, as, I mean, I don't, I don't really know what else to do really, but I also think it's, it's weird right now. You know, this is the first week really that I've been out of rehearsal since all this happened. Cause even in between the two mad forest things, I've remotely shot a music video, which was like an interesting experience. Um, so it's, um, I'm finding that, uh, like, you know, my way of processing kind of everything, it, it's, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit amputated right now because I don't have the output, the outlet of like thinking about how to make a piece of work and thereby, you know, filtering, you know, emotions and um, psychologies and states of the world and stru structural societies and things like that through, through, through a lens of making something. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a very, yeah, it's an interesting experience, but I don't, um, but I'm, but I'm like, I am, you know, I am cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic that there's a lot of um, energy right now that um, I've, I, you know, I keep on telling myself that I don't have the information to know that the future is going to be worse than the past and that what was the past is that that was a different world that's, that's done with. Um, uh, so and without the knowledge to know that the future is going to be worse than that, I should, you know, I should just remain as rigorously present as possible and, um, and, and try to figure out where my energy can be best directed to serve the, you know, the greater good. Um, yeah. That mm. doesn't answer what it's like to break I into know, the but <laughs> field. I, but. Um, I, I, um, I do hear you. Um, you said this play, you had the intuition it would be the right play for the time we are in. Why do you make theater? What, 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 what motivates you in live this hard life? Um, Again, I mean, I don't... I, why, I, why, what's your idea about theater in general? What is your, why do you do it? Um, I do, I don't, you know, I mean, I do it because it's, it's real, it is like, weirdly all I've done, you know, I grew I mean, I, when I, even when I was a kid, I, you know, I, I grew up uh, in different places all over the country and, um, and I would kind of like, I would always like organize my friends around some, uh, um, 
group imaginary imaginary reality or whatever and 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 you know tell stories and start scripting things i mean i started doing theater in schools where there wasn't actually theater you know i'd you know i'd take a history project and say let me write a script about you know uh, the, the, the creation of the atomic bomb, even though I didn't know, but, but so I just like, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, it felt, it just seems, it seems natural to me. Um, and, uh, um, uh, so, but I will say that I do, I have always, whenever I'm working on a piece and from, you know, from before high school to through high school to, you know, to, to anything that I make, it is, it is always interesting to me or necessary for me to, 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 to approach it from a humanist perspective, I guess, is, is maybe the best way to articulate it. And um, which is, you know, how, how are we telling stories of people that bring people closer together because they're able to, uh, because they're experiencing people in a way that maybe they haven't before or um, or given the space to um, feel uncomfortable around people in a way that they haven't before. Um, so, th I mean, th that's, I guess that's why I, why I make work. And I do, you know, and it, and it is the case that most of the people, you know, I was thinking um, during Occupy, I was making um, Good Person of Szechuan and, you know, and kind of would go down to, to Occupy and, and, you know, and you know, we we actually did. I forgot that we um, did. We uh, actually one of the uh, Jess uh, um, was the dramaturg on that, and I forget that we actually did. You know, we we invited people from Occupy to watch one of our productions of Good Person of Szechuan. I mean, the, I, I find that for you know, I I can't work on a piece if it doesn't somehow resonate with what I'm like, you know, seeing going on in the world. And again, that's a very limited perspective, um, you know, based off of you know my point of view. Um, uh, but but that kind of gives me the energy to make and then and then just aesthetically uh, in a larger sense I do the reason that I you know I was a musician before I um, before I really started focusing on theater but but and the reason that I really became interested in theater was because I saw even without really knowing what theater was I did see the potential for it being something where you know music visual art performance um, history uh, the examination of social structures, all these things could, could exist together in a form and that it would also affect, that it has the potential of affecting people in a way that bypasses the, the brain. And so their, their whole body becomes a receptor for information and experiences and knowledge in, in a way that we don't traditionally um, uh, appreciate in, in, in our society. So, uh, so that's why I kind of also over the years have become more interested in in a multimedia approach is because I feel like there's this kind of, you know, when the whole when the whole person the whole body is immersed in experiences, you know, it's kind of like it's it's like living in a field of poetry rather than you know reading poetry on a page or something. So that's um, I think that's why I do theater the form of theater, and that's why also I get frustrated when we're kind of told where theater belongs physically and um, um, topic wise and, and by whom, you know, who is allowed to, to, to tell the stories that are presented in theater um, and for whom. I, that's the thing that was, that's I think really thrilling about potentially the online forum. And again, there's a lot of conversation about who's able to have access to the internet, which is also an appalling conversation. Um, but but th there is also um, you know when we streamed the when we streamed uh, the um, the event on Wednesday at least there were sixteen hundred viewers who watched most of the thing and this, these were not people who were like checking and checking out I mean I was watching and they watched at least uh, I think at least an hour and twenty an hour and a uh, half of the performance stayed online and they were you know they were watching from you know from Bangkok from uh, uh, they were watching from from Romania, like we were getting notes from from Romanians. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're fr from Ghana, from Germany, from you know. I mean, that to me is is really thrilling, and that's where the the real potential for for who can see the work, and then also, like I say, the the, the you know the the, str the physical structure of of the the theatrical machine is decentralized as well. Um, so you can have your collaborators all over the world. Um, so that I think is really uh, is really thrilling and has a lot of potential um, 
And I also think that there's a different kind of audience that maybe we can reach out to. Like people, there are people who are used to coming to a theater in New York City and sitting down and having this type of experience, but there's also an audience that maybe is more interested in engaging um, online work in a different type of way. You know, like people who do want to have a chat in the middle of a performance or um, who, you know, who have a, who have online kind of persona or, um, um, or communities, you know? And I think that that's, I think that's exciting. I don't think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I actually spend um, a lot of time being incredibly grateful for, 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 for life in the theater. You know, I mean, I think it's, um, uh, you know, regularly, I can't, I mean, I can't believe the people who I get to work with, the places where I get to go because I make theater. I mean, like I've traveled around the world solely because I make theater. Um, I, you know, I get to work with incredibly compassionate, you know, generous, um, collaborative, super intelligent, uh, talented human beings. You know, I, I'm really, uh, I don't, you know, it's kind of like, I've had conversations with people about, you know, people who, who leave, leave New York. And I've lived here now, um, I moved here in October of 2001. So, um, uh, and, um, and it's kind of like, I, I, you know, you can get more space for, for less money, but you don't also get to go to, you know, uh, to a gallery show that a friend of yours uh, has has made, you know, um, uh, I mean, the, you know, knowing knowing artists in all different um, media and 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 experiences is uh, it makes me feel like a, like like a fuller human being. And I don't. And I, there are a lot of ways to feel like a full human being, and but this is the way that I feel like a, a full human being yeah. for now. Um, I, I we now already know that it changed your work or the way also you did work with this kind of invention um, um, what you guys did but um, did you change as a person that experience of COVID of, uh, of the lockdown even though you worked hard uh, almost every day do you feel something has changed um I you know I I mean practically I guess I've been meditating a lot more I mean I already had a meditation practice but that would be the thing when people say what are you doing right now I'm like well I'm I am meditating a lot more and so I'm, every morning when you get up oh yeah well that that was the case before this but I what um, do you do tell us a bit what do I do with my meditation <laughs> yeah when in your day how does it work how do you do it my day, okay well right now right now weirdly my day has been i've been getting up between five and five thirty every morning um mostly because of the birds which is really incredible uh and uh and i sit for you know 20 minutes and then i have the whole like you know stretching thing that i have to do because so i have you know arthritis and whatever i have to do a whole like stretching thing um and then i uh i do a um i I, I make a list of people who I'm going to check in with to during the day, like, you know, just to see how they're doing. Um, uh, and they like decide over the course of the day when I'll check in with whom and things like that, and whether it'll be by a text or zoom or, um, or phone call. Um, and, you know, and then I kind of like get into the news and then I do some reading on, um, I'm reading a few different, uh, I mean, the th you know, I will say that the thing with my meditation practice that's changed is I haven't really studied a particular type of practice. I've just, you know, sat and, and, and breathed and tried to be still. Uh, but now I am doing a little, I'm, I mean, it's still a, a mess of different, um, different, you know, uh, traditions that I'm looking at. But um, I have been doing this course on the Bardo, which I find really interesting right now. So I've been d d doing a course, it's a so, so, um, you know, contemplating that kind of experience of, of change, um, and, and the end of a period and the, you know, what the beginning of a period c can be, um, and how much control we don't have over all of that. Um, and then I've also started this new practice that I've started is, a uh, we're studying, uh, Dogen, which I've never read. So I'm, I'm excited about, um, you know, looking at that. Um, and then I usually, uh, and then, and then in addition, most days a week now, I also do a sitting at the end of the day as well. And I also have to, you know, I have to kind of shut things down at the end of the day and do some reading and do some writing at the end of the day to just kind of, um, shut everything down. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, it, and then, I mean, the middle of the day is mostly spent, you know, maybe going outside, contemplating going outside, um, to get some kind of exercise, like on my crutches, I do crutch about, um, and, uh, and 
you know, and also I, I'm doing, I'm, I'm donating right now to different organizations and causes and things like that, where I feel like it's, it can be helpful. Um, and, uh, I'm also asking people to send me work to read and look at because, you know, I used to, I used to go see a lot of work and hear a lot of work and go to museums and galleries and friends openings and things like that. So, um, so I'm asking people like who have plays, like some, you know, friends have been sending me plays that they're working on and um, videos that they're making and things like that, just so I can, you know, <laughs> have a conversation with them. And I do have a lot, you know, yesterday morning, I spent all morning uh, talking to people in Berlin about maybe like that, um, which is exciting. Uh, and, um, and I've been talking to other people about, you know, potential projects and they kind of break down into two categories. They either break down into categories where we say they have to happen in real life. So therefore we're willing to think of developing this for five years, if that's what it will take before we can be together in a real space, or it weirdly, this material will work better online. Like there's one project in particular that I think actually could work better online. So maybe we'll pursue it in that way. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have, there are two like, you know, smaller, I'm doing something with the, you know, Beth Morrison projects is doing a new um, initiative for an online experience. And so I'll be, I'm working on that right now. And, um, and I do, and I have, before all this began, I re got a residency from um, this uh, space in Red Hook uh, that Andromache Chalfant and M, M. Sharkey are running. And, you know, and that has changed what that residency can look like. And I think, I hope that I'll still be able to have a residency as a generative artist. And the piece that I want to make is like, um, it's an, um, uh, it's an installation, uh, it's an installation, uh, like kind of sculptural space, sound space that also is a, is a VR opera layered on top of it. Um, so there'd be a, a, a narrative um, VR space that is in a headset and I, and, you know, it could be, experienced by a single person so maybe that's something that we that is um uh isolation or uh social distancing compliant so i'm you know hoping that i'll be able to work on that in in august maybe um but you know but it is very i think it's a uh, you know whatever you think is going to happen at the beginning of the day doesn't end up happening 12 hours later so i'm kind of um uh just being open to whatever whatever might happen um and then try and then trying to be really vigilant about you know um again about you know my friends and my, and my um you know people who i really care about checking in with them um and uh and and also trying to figure out how to make sure that that you know come november we're you know we're we're voting somehow. <laughs> we're voting and we are, we are working. Listen, um, Ashley, this is uh, incredible. Thank you for sharing. And uh, we got a, an insight of your racing mind and you had to slow sure. down for us a little bit, but really thank you for, for sharing. You know, it's a, a great what you found when you didn't stop what you were doing and try to find a new form and you did. And I think it opens up in a way a new world, as you also said, globally, uh, theater without there's theater without audience, there's theater without uh, scenery, there's this theater without um, um, a script, whatever. Now we have a theater without a room. Um, who would have said that? The def definition by Peter Brook always where two people meet in a room and one person watches or even nobody watches and you have theater <laughs> and we don't have that room anymore. Something has changed. Software is coming in. The digital, it used to be the light became digital, the great work of Robert Wilson, which he anticipated already it was an analog, but uh, the digital soundscapes that came up, the digital film work, and now we have the digital software helping us with cues, stage managers running a stage without a stage and uh, perhaps even busier than before. Productions happened with 20, 30 people and no one is in the same room. These are incredible times and, um, and we are part of it and uh, you really are shaping this. So again, congratulations. Any foundation is looking, give some money to this group of people to finish the <laughs> software <clears throat> so they can license it out for a little money to all companies. So you have something out of it and uh, really support uh, this. And also, you know, anytime happy to host, to host a how round session with the team and about how to use that software. If that's thinkable, um, just um, let us know. Um, did Carol Churchill see it? She did. Yeah, she did. What did she and say? Um, she was really kind and she, um, uh, she said it reminded her uh, of, she said it brought her right back to being there and to, to and, and the other person who's, I mean, she, yeah, she, you know, she was really, uh, she, she said it, it brought her right back to being there and, um, and the time when they made it and, 
Um, and she felt, she said it felt very Romanian, which I took as a compliment. Um, and, uh, the other person was, uh, Anthony McDonald, who was the original designer on that production. I just worked with him at mm -hmm. the Armory. And so I've been in correspondence with him quite a bit, actually. And, and I also sent it to him and he, uh, he, he, he also, uh, watched it and, and had a very similar response. So, um, I feel really, um, yeah, like I say, I mean, I'm kind of, I, I'm on a daily basis, I'm, I'm <laughs> pretty blown away by how, uh, by the people that um, I get to, uh, that I've had the fortune of being able to speak with, yeah. including you, Frank. Oh, well, so, I, thank I you wish very I much. would be uh, <laughs> as significant as the other, but listen, um, congratulation. Uh, you should be so proud of what you did. It's a model uh, to look at and um, what you found, what you created your life, uh, you're dedicating to the work of art and theater and to help us all to come to terms with what us it mean to zoom, what could it be? Are there possibilities? Is that, you know, to see that there are possibilities we haven't thought about and really and stunning, it comes out of a tiny little group, uh, the big Broadway commercial complex. We should have an interest how this should go with five, six, seven billion uh, of uh, money made in a year and they haven't come up uh, with something like this. So it's incredible and we will see where it goes from. And, um, and um, yeah, and then next week, again, we will uh, focus on what is happening here in New York? Of course, uh, Ashley's experience of COVID, of the lockdown, is a peculiar one connected to her as an artist and their time. Everybody experiences it differently. But we will, um, of course, um, focus next week on what is happening. And we have Ngozi and Yanbu uh, with us also. And again, James Strax, Tamila Woodard, uh, Nigel Smith can make it. I hope he will come another week. Woody King, who for 50 years ran a theater, uh, a black theater company. What, what, let's see what's happening. Jonathan McCrory from the National Black Theater and the great uh, philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, who will hopefully tell us a little bit about art and why do we need it and why um, is it um, significant? I hope you will join us. Uh, and uh, thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, Travis and uh, uh, Thea and VJ, my Siegel team, Andy and, uh, and uh, Sun Young, and to all of you of listeners, really thank you for listening also for such a long time. You know, I don't know, moving into a little bit of a longer format, but also today, I think it was a very important and interesting update, very different from all the talks we had now. This was about working, about finding ways, wakes that were found new new ways we uh, we perhaps can move forward even if everybody is back in the theaters um, and that something is changing and has already changed and um, but you're right the election something has to be done i think it was antonio Gramsci, the great philosopher who said um, uh, when the old days haven't gone yet and the new times hasn't arrived in this chiaroscuro and this hell hellish darkness uh, it's not clear what it was. That's when monsters do come out. And I think we all have to fight that and be together. And I think that as you found in this extreme situation, you were under to stop it or not. I think there's also something for this country to find uh, something, a uh, solution that will make it uh, at least uh, a, a great option also made better ways and better forms and better structures. So thank you for listening. Also you listeners again, and for taking your time. I know how much uh, is on your d every day and, um, how much digital content is out there, but it is important that we listen to them. And I hope it's also something meaningful inside for you. So if we you all, I hope uh, um, next week, stay safe and stay tuned in. And Ashley, thank you again. Thanks very much, Frank.